Studs Terkel, the Pulitzer Prize winning oral historian, has a new book, Coming of Age, the story of our century by those who've lived it. It's a collection of interviews he conducted with people aged 70 through 99 collectively, serving as a portrait of American life. Studs Terkel, actor, disc jockey, sports commentator, and for the last 38 years, radio talk show host. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very it's much. It's nice to see you again. Thank you. Now, how did this book come about? Naturally. Naturally. <laughs> yes. It came about because, I guess, in a way, it's the denouement. It's the one that, e that ends all the other books, perhaps leads to this. One of the books dealt with the Great American Depression. What was it like? an ordinary person during the big fall when the wise guys slept on a banana peel, didn't know what hit him. We've forgotten about that period. Another's about World War II, called the Good War, in quotes, because war, the noun, and the adjective right. never did fit. Right. Even World War II. Another's it it working, was a just war, but not a, not a good hmm? war. It may have been a just war, but not a good war. Not a good war, no. And no war is, because even the mm. best of kids becomes a savage. Mm. And so we come to this one, people who lived through this century. Now, we live in a crazy time, don't we? Here's this, we're five years away from the new millennium, right? The year 2000. This century had the Great Depression, a war that changed the map of the world, the psyche of the world, Cold War in which good conversation was considered un-American. We're scared, inhibited, still carries over, because the trivia we hear today passes for news. Vietnam and a war should never have been in, of course. I say, of course. You may disagree. I say, of course. And the computer age. And we have a young generation of good, decent people who haven't the faintest idea what the past was like. And so you've got these people who were storytellers, who bore witness to this quite remarkable and horrendous century, who were the storytellers, the griots, what Alex Haley called the griots, the storytellers. And it's my hope is they'll be heard. It's done. You talk about it, uh, and I think you use the phrase collective amnesia. Mm -hmm. uh, we forget about our past, but America as a country has always been about the future, not about the past. The whole notion of America was of people coming from all over the world, letting their past go, forging a new kind of culture, a new identity, a new American, and thinking about the future. America is a country about the future. How can you have a future when there's nothing in the past? How can you have a future built out of zero? How can we have a future without a past? How can we have a future without a present? So talk about a future as nonsense, unless there's a memory of what went wrong back then, so we won't repeat the mistakes as we are doing today. So that's what it's about. I don't want to quote Santayana, by this time it's a old right. truism. Then why repeat it? Well, let me ask you, in terms of the people that you interviewed here, just as in, the, in, a, in a general way, did you interview them because of what they do or because of the kind of person, persona or personality that they are? It's a combination. They are what they are because of what they do. Now, all these people dealt with some, had some sense of community. Now, you may have opened the book with a quote of Bernard Shaw. Yes. And the old boy is talking about his life has no meaning unless connected with community. And it's followed with a guy who had fifth grade education, a guy named Joe Begley, this is in my introduction, who runs a general store in the most poverty-stricken town in eastern Kentucky, Blackie. And Joe says, without, I'll work in this community to better it, no matter what these big boys may do to it. He met the coal operators, strip miners. And he's talking the same language Shaw is. Neither one heard of the other. So in a sense, every one, as he, she recalls that youth, that vicar, that spirit, out beyond self, becomes that person again, becomes our chronicler, our historian. Well, you talk about a memory of the past, and if the memory of the past, in a sense, focuses on community, uh, this is something which surely is sort of eroding in an urban life, in a commercial life where people have to move for their jobs, uh, move to find jobs who move. I mean, America is a country on the move. It's very hard to establish that connection with community in the sense that I think you, you mean it. You've got plants on the move, too, don't right. you? Right, absolutely. You've got, a, you've, you've got plants, industrial plants on the move to places where there are no unions, where the labor may pay some communities in other countries two, three bucks a day. Now, who's making those moves? Who's responsible for those moves? Now, these people in this book talk about these things from way back and now. 
And so we can't talk of generalities about a future or about a nomadic people. You know, what the movement is all about and what it means and who does what to whom. And not that all these people think along the same lines. Each one is an independent, I feel. I choose that, choose them. And what is remarkable about them is their humor. They, they, by the way, they're not putting down their own lives. They've had full, rich lives with certain rueful memories of th mistakes they made. They worry about the young who have no sense of past, who have what I call, not they, many of the old too have it, a national Alzheimer's disease. Mm. There is no yesterday. So that's what they worry about. And that's what the book is about, in a sense. Well, in terms of community, I just want to sort of fix in on, on that, because I think that was much more a part of an earlier America, where community was a sense of place. Now you have communities that are more joined by common interests rather than a geography. Do you think that can make it up? I mean, for example, if you have people on computers, you can get all the chess players in America somehow they're connected together through some kind of computerized connection. Is if that we going to work if for we you? Were do you machines think? rather than flesh and blood people, it would work. But we are flesh and blood people who are mm. fast becoming mm. thinking like machines. Even the language you used at this moment confuses me. See, when you say hardware and software to me, hardware is a hammer and nails. Software is linens, pillowcases, Turkish towels. You see, what is happening with the computer, that is good. I'm not going to be the old curmudgeon putting. What is good is that it saves time and energy. It does that. But it loses something else in the process, or thus far it has. And that's the sense of personal touch. When the old doctor in that book asked the young doctor, the young intern, how'd our patient do last night? Miss Smith, how'd she do? He just a minute. And he punches into the latest lab test that comes out. She's great. No, I mean, how did she sleep? Was the pain any different than the one she talked about? He doesn't know. There was a laying on of the hands of which he knows nothing. So you have the loss of personal touch, the loss of the use of a hand tool, for example. All this is lost as we speak of the, God help us, computer, the computerized age. Even the, even the voices of the young and many become me mechanized. Mm. They imitate. You ever been to the Atlanta airport? No, I haven't. Can I tell this very quick? Yeah, sure. It's a cautionary tale, it's a funny story, but it's a telling one, I think. <laughs> so the Atlanta airport is very modern, you leave the gate, and there come the trains, take you different concourses, and you walk in this train that's smooth and silent, and people are that crowded, silent. You've got that voice up there. It's a human voice, but he speaks mechanically. He says, Concourse 1, Dallas, Fort Worth, Concourse 2, Omaha, Lincoln. He says, and just a young couple rush in, part the nomadic doors, and make it. And that voice, without losing a beat, says, because of late entry, we're delayed 30 seconds. And everybody looks at that couple silently, or looks at that couple, you know, vengefully, and they're shrinking. And I had a few drinks. So I call out in the manner of a train caller, George Orwell, your time has come and gone. I expect to laugh. You know, silence. And suddenly, I shrink. And I quail. The three of us are there at Mount Calvary. We're the guilty ones, see. And then, I see a kid, a baby, about a year old in the lap of the mother. I say to the baby, remember, I had a few drinks. <laughs> I'll so remember. I my breath that way, so of course it probably was 100 proof. <laughs> and so I say uh, to the baby, what is your considered opinion of all this? The kid gives you that look, baby's look, you clear in the air. And he starts, the kid starts laughing. So I see a human reaction. Thank God, there's still hope. Well, in the sense, What's happening is we become kind of mechanized and zombieized in this process of progress. Well, listen, you've been around for most of the uh, decades of this century. Which was your favorite decade? Ah, there wasn't any favorite. I liked uh, the 30s, tough though it was, because my youth was there. I liked the 60s. That's the decade that's put down by every two-bit pundit in the book, 60s, druggies and excesses. 60s was the time the young had a cause outside themselves, causes. Freedom summer, civil rights revolution, anti-war mm -hmm. movement. And so I kind of like, it's funny, it's fashionable to put that down. Someone said, Joan Nestle, a name is said, uh, people delight in the failure of the 60s, those who delight in the failure of dreams. I like that. Mm -hmm. Those you, begrudgers. You know. I, I've always sort of had the notion that people kind of fix a certain age in their mind and they see themselves at that age for a very long period of time. 
Um, would you say that, in a sense, the 30s was that period of time where you felt most defined? And because if, if I think about it, you are an oral historian. That was a time of radio. That was a time of conversation. We didn't have television. We didn't have a lot of other things. Is that what sort of uh, prompted you to get into this? Well, no, what prompted me then was just his curiosity mm -hmm. and a publisher who was interested in, the, in this sort of thing. Uh, it's, I'm called oral historian, whatever that means. I call myself a guerrilla journalist as I horse around. Well, what does that around. mean? Well, I just try to find out the terrain. Well, the American colonials were guerrilla journalists, the Swamp Fox. The Vietnamese were guerrilla, guerrilla fighters against us. We were the Redcoats. And so guerrilla knows his area, so I, I sort of horse around it. I improvise a great deal. That's why I like jazz. But nonetheless, there's a plan throughout. And in a sense, this curiosity of what makes the human being tick? Mostly, what makes the ordinary person tick? See, the thing about the young, no, what was life like for someone like his grandparents or someone like himself or herself back then? Whether it be the Depression, whether it be World War II, whether it be at the workplace, whether it be McCarthy days, whether it be now. And once you know what it was like, you have a feeling for history. We live in, a, I guess, not a his, anti historical time. That's why the phonies get away with all the junk they're dishing out. Yeah, I'm not so sure I agree with you on that because I, I actually, don't. I actually That's why do I said think, it. I do think that, for example, the computer will give people a much easier access to their past and to a visual as well as an oral description of their past through CD-ROMs and through the whole uh, remarkable efficiency of the access to knowledge. I'm not putting down the computer. Mm as such, mm. nor am I putting down television as such. It's the manner in which it's being used that worries me. That's the aspect. Like TV, for example. We know it was good during the Civil Rights Revolution, and yet its purpose today is to pass the good, sell it, to hit that generation, like the young louts and oafs who run the Bud Light commercials say. Are they the young people? There are certain kind of young people who have a buck or two in their pocket, most young people are lost and bewildered and worried and saying, I'm not going to be as well off as my old man, which is a reversal of the American dream. Right. You, you interviewed all of these people. They were all, as you say, between 70 and 99. What was your sort of surprise? Was there any commonality to their... Uh, the commonality is they didn't mind their own lives. They didn't feel they lost. They were pretty full. They were grieving for the young, mm -hmm. plus aches and pains and sense of mortality, which is always there. And that's a common ache. But also, as they talk of a certain moment, you know, some of the old people say, I forgot, you forget, I forgot where I put the keys, you know. I forgot where I put my glasses. But they remember that moment in their lives, that's a moment in our country. Like this woman, Janora Johnson Dollinger. She's on her third pacemaker. She's got a dozen pills around. She can hardly move, she's all studs. I can't move. I says, Janora, do you remember? And then I say, you remember 1937, Flint, Michigan? She was the heroine of the Flint sit-down strike when the UAW was being organized. And she remembers, and then she suddenly becomes this 21-year-old girl. She's on top of that sound truck. When we were to come out through the police lines, the guys are sitting in, and tear gas is being tossed in to smoke them out. And she asked these women to come out. And one woman comes out, and she cop stops her and she goes right through the cops. The cop holds her coat, left holding the sleeves of her coat. She walks through. Another does. We won the strike. Then she falls back and says, I use her words for crying out loud. This should be a better world than it is. And this 83-year-old woman becomes that 21, 22-year-old. Mm -hmm. remembering, remembering. They remember those glory moments. Well, what if you had to sort of pick out one or two things that in a sense They've lived through so many changes. I mean, from uh, automobiles, trains, planes, jet planes, the interstate highway system, television, uh, the whole emergence of the feminist movement, uh, the whole transformation of our, at least our public attitude mm -hmm. towards race. What, what sort of, in a sense, came through uh, the mass education, and not just mass education, but mass higher education, which what we've had comes, since the end of World War II. What through is the idea of great possibilities not really realized by the great many. What comes through is progress, certainly technological progress will hold of that. What comes through in some cases, and I am one, I'm not a Luddite, you know, the 
agricultural workers who right. would destroy the machines because they put them out of work. But I'm sort of a closet Luddite to some extent. And I'm coming out. Being on this show as being a closet Luddite, you go uh, ahead. No, that's just the point. I'm also <laughs> contradictory. I'm on TV. I use a tape recorder for my stuff, so I do that. I value the fact that a washing machine helps a woman. She doesn't have to smack the clothes against the rock. That's all valuable. But there comes the law of diminishing, not delight, diminishing something, diminishing flesh and bloodism. And I think that's the part that, that bothers me a great deal. But we've lived through, this is a remarkable century. Right. You think we're five years away from a new millennium, let alone new century. I mean, haven't we learned anything from this past century and those before? That's what it's about, too. Well, there are a lot of people who would think that, uh, in a sense, all of these uh, new, uh, newfangled things like uh, uh, television, for example, and uh, offers uh, possibilities in terms of the improvement to the quality of life on a mass you basis know, that, uh, that uh, we've uh, never had before. watching the show right now is in the book, Charlie Andrews, yeah. who is the inventor of Chicago, TV Chicago style. It was mm -hmm. three shows. Cooper Franali, he was Dave Garraway's first writer, Garraway at large, mm -hmm. and the thing I was involved with called Studs Place. Charlie invented two of them. And Charlie speaks of TV then and the possibilities within it like Kukla, and that world he created of tenderness and love and delight. That'd be knocked out of the window today. Something else today. So as it becomes more and more cruel and vulgar in a sense, not that the medium is, but that it's used in that manner. Well, isn't it used That's both important. ways, though, Stud? I mean, isn't it used in one sense going down market to, to all this sort of tabloid television, but it's also used for whether it's McNeil Lehrer or the, 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 the uh, history and the, the arts and entertainment network. We've had a proliferation. Of there's some good stuff. You know, a lot of good stuff that never appeared before on television. the overall effect. The overall effect that does help to some extent make people feel helpless and impotent and couch potato-ish to a great extent. However, there's good stuff that should be far, far more. And the misuse of the phrase liberal media, which is the joke of the century. Right, it course. certainly is. Liberal media, you got radio with Limbaugh and his clones down the line, yeah. everywhere. Talk radio is overwhelmingly conservative. You've got anyone answering? Hardly. You've got public television called Radical with Buckley as a mm. host, John McLaughlin as a host, Tony Brown, a conservative black, as a host. You think Noam Chomsky's on every night the way they talk? See, <laughs> well, this, it's this perversion of the yes. American language that gets me. Since I appear on the McLaughlin show, I'll take a modest defense of that yeah. show, but we're coming to the end of our time, and I want to thank you for joining us and I will ask you all to come back uh, in a short while while we interview the very gifted writer Dorothy Allison. She's great by the way. She's wonderful. She is wonderful.